you'll find I often do this, but today what I'd like to do is leave space for a heading. I really hate when a heading is a spoiler for what you're actually going to learn. Don't worry, I'll fill it in and if I forget, just tell me and then we'll fill it in. You might feel like these questions that arrived at these answers are kind of like, really? Is this what I signed up to extension two to do? Um, like I said, it starts off gentle and it get deep, gets deep really fast. You actually did, unbeknownst to you, a history lesson just as you were going through these questions. I'd love you to have, if you've got another color next to whatever color you just did these questions, pull that out. Uh, and if you do not have another color, borrow from someone and then fix that because you'll find colors are gonna be very, very useful in communicating and understanding what you're doing here. We went through a potted history of all the different kinds of numbers that we as mathematicians use all the time, right? And these are pretty familiar, right? The first number is the most basic kind of number that anyone has ever come up with. And I'm gonna introduce some symbols here which you need to be aware of. This is an N, you can see it's got two sort of solid lines through it, which is um, part of set notation. When you see these two lines going through, you know this is not just a pro numeral. This stands for a whole set of different numerals. This N stands for, does anyone have a guess? A very basic, important part of the number system. The natural numbers, very good. Um, also called the counting numbers because that's exactly what we do with them. We count one, two, three, four. Since prehistory, before things were written down, we were counting, right? But fairly quickly we realized there are more numbers than just one, two, three, four, and so on. Um, these numbers here are not natural numbers. They're not counting numbers. You don't count up to a half. Does anyone know what family of numbers this belongs to? Any takers? Yeah, go ahead. Starts with an R, by the way. Rational numbers. Rational numbers, very good. Now, because we like to try and be completely sensible, the symbol for rational numbers is not an R, it's a Q. Um, does anyone want to guess why might it be Q? What word to do with this starts with a Q? This is division, right? Think, think, go ahead. Quotient, Quotient. very good. So, so that Q is a reference to that idea. Rational numbers, again, in the name, it's about a ratio between two numbers. And so we're pretty familiar with those, but they took a while to develop in terms of mathematics. Uh, zero kind of sort of doesn't belong specially into any particular family, but I do wonder, does anyone know how long did it take us to come up with the idea of zero? Does anyone know roughly when it came into vogue? I'll give you a clue way later than you would think. Any takers? Anyone have it? just hazard a guess? When do you think we really came up with this idea? And yeah, go ahead. 1900s. 1900s. So... It was a long time ago, longer than the 1900s though, so we did a little bit better than that. From memory, it's the 1100s, which is still like, oh, it's like at least we've got like a millennium, sort of, but still, just think about how long we've been doing these and how long it took us to come with this idea of zero. I should point out, by the way, um, Hindu, and, um, Hindu mathematicians in India beat us by several centuries, so I think it's really important that we recognize that. Mathematics is a universal pursuit. Then we come down to these guys. Uh, back in year seven, we called these directed numbers, but they have a more technical name. Starts with an I. Anyone remember? Integer. These are the integers. Again, because we want to mess with you, the symbol for integers is not an I. Does anyone know what the symbol is? Z. It's a Z. Very good. Again, with those two lines there. Um, a reference to the German mathematicians um, who did a lot of exploration in this field. Um, Zahl, Z A H L, is uh, German for, for counting or counter. Um, and then this last one down here doesn't belong to any of these sets. What would we call this? We'll call it irrational, which is why irrational, it's a name that means not one of these, right? We just take that symbol, the Q, and we pop a, um, a tilde on the, over the top, which means not that, right? Not in the set of rational numbers. Now the important thing I want to get across to you as we looked through these is that each set of numbers, it kind of breaks the rules of the previous set of numbers, right? Um, if for example, you have a look at part D, right? If you asked uh, like a five-year-old child to subtract some numbers, they could do it. If you said, hey, what's seven take away three? They'd look at their fingers for a second and then they would repeat to you four, no problems. But if you ask the same child, can you tell me what three take away seven is, do it the other way, they'd be like, they'd get their fingers out and then they'd say, okay, well, here's my three. And then I start taking away to get to seven and I'm like, oh, you can't do it. No answer, 
right? Now, this was you many years ago, okay? But we came to realize there's more to this than just the things that you can count. If we put direction on these numbers, that's actually really useful for things like temperature or debt. Finance is actually where these were really, really useful. Now, this is kind of where we've gone. I should put on one more if you want to put an F on here. For reasons that are actually really deep and profound, I couldn't write an equation that would do this, but you've got numbers like these guys, right? Um, everything you just saw here, they're what we call the algebraic numbers because you can form them with the rules of algebra. Um, pi and E, you can't do that with those guys. So they are not algebraic. There's the A for algebraic numbers. So they're not algebraic, but because these numbers are so wicked and cool, we give them an even more special name. We call them, and this has to be one of the greatest names in all of naming anything really. We call these guys the transcendental numbers, okay? Now if you take everything there, this is all the numbers you've ever had to do anything with in 12 years of schooling. All of these guys, as a big happy family, they belong to one big sort of superset, if you like. And this one is part of the reason why we don't use the R for this. This one does start with an R. It's a name maybe you've heard of. Does anyone know what these are called? Real. The real numbers. Thank you. The real numbers, these guys are what you've been playing ball with. And as you can see, they're inclusive of centuries of mathematical development. The real numbers, they're pretty cool. Just one tiny little problem. Yeah, question. Oh, are we distinguishing between n and n plus? Uh, I'm going to leave that very, very important distinction off of this discussion, mainly because I'm talking here about our progression through there. Does it include zero or not? You can see I delightfully dodged that question a little bit. We can have a discussion about that another time okay. when we have more time. Good question though. So the real numbers, right? Um, they include a lot of things, but there are signs in the mathematics you've already done that actually there's more to the universe than this. And my clue, there are many different clues, but my clue was in this pair of questions that I gave you here, right? Sum and product of roots. Sum and product of roots. Let's have a think about these guys for a second. Uh, not this whiteboard marker. This was the equation I gave you, sorry, the expression I gave you for that sum and product of roots. And then from memory, I think the expression was this, right? Is this right? Yeah. Okay, great. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. I hope you went directly like this, whoever did this working did, to alpha plus beta equals, how did you get that by the way? It's, what ratio is it? It's minus B on A, B on a fantastic. And then for this it's C on A. Okay, so we could go directly to those results without knowing, let's just write that here, without knowing what alpha and beta are, you can still work out what the independent sum and product are, right? Can you go ahead, just for the sake of it, go ahead and solve this guy. Right? You're going to get alpha and beta. Can you do that? Because I just need to wake up something on my screen for a second. OK, that didn't take long, right? Go ahead and tell me. Um, I keep on picking up the same pen. Uh, go ahead and tell me. It doesn't matter which one's which, obviously. Uh, what are alpha and beta? What did you get? Negative three and? Negative three. Fantastic. And we could have interchanged them, that's fine. So we're like, no big deal. Of course they are negative three and negative two because you factorize this as x plus two, x plus three, um, or whatever method you chose. Went for the quadratic formula if you were particularly masochistic. And you can see this confirms exactly what we saw here before, right? You add these two together, you get negative five. You multiply them, you get six. All good, right? Except Something weird happens when you just have a look at this other seemingly harmless quadratic. And to illustrate this, we're going to draw something. Um, you're going to see, if, for those of you who are not in Mrs. Lee's class, you might not know, we have an obsession with graphing. Even things you're like, why would you graph that? That doesn't say graph. We make you graph anyway because it's instructful. It helps you see things. So I want you to draw for me a set of axes, a Cartesian plane. And what I'd like to do is to take this quadratic and to graph it. Now, I'm going to do it in a slightly unusual way. Um, there are many ways to graph y equals x squared plus 2x plus 4, but I'm going to try and call on the knowledge of what you developed in, actually it was around, it was around lockdown time, actually, when we were doing graphing techniques in the advanced course, right? And functions like this we could think of in terms of transformations, like stretching, dilation, shifts, that kind of thing, okay? So to do that, I'm going to take this guy here, 
And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to separate out that 4 on the end there. I'm going to separate it out into two different numbers. Two different numbers that are both inside 4 that will come from completing the square on this guy. And you might think, completing the square, that's a bit out of left field. Why am I completing the square? This seems rather unnecessary. Stay with me, it will be useful in a second. To complete the square, what do you add to x squared plus 2x? You add 1, right? Because you take this coefficient here, you halve it, and then you square it. In this case, you halve it, you get 1, you square it, you get 1. So that's the 1 there, OK? That leaves, as part of that 4, that leaves a 3 on this side. OK with that? 1 plus 3 is 4. We're all good. The reason why we complete the square is it's a useful way to factorize, right? So this thing here is a perfect square, namely x plus 1 all squared. I'm not that old, but you're going to need to speak up a little bit for me, year 12, because um, yeah, my hearing's not that great. So there's my perfect square. Now this plus 3, I hope you can see, it is actually, go back to your graphing techniques, right? It's actually not interacting with the x. It's not about a horizontal shift. It's really, though it's on the right-hand side, it's really interacting with the y. It's actually a vertical shift. So I'm going to write it in this form, y minus 3 equals. Is that OK? Same deal. 3 on that side, negative 3 on this side. Okay? Why is this helpful? Why is this a good way to write this? Because when I come to graph, I can now think of this as a regular old parabola, like y equals x squared, with two differences. What, what are the two differences? Those are the two numbers there. Can someone tell me one of them? What does the y minus 3 do? How is it different to my regular parabola? Can you take it? It makes it go up by three units. It's been raised, so that's really good. So instead of being at the origin, I'm going to be up this way. And then what about the other shift? What's that? Left by one, fantastic. So instead of my vertex being at the origin, my vertex is now going to be, you said, up by three, left by one. So let's go ahead and put that on here. I'm going to call that uh, negative one comma three. So far, so good. And that's the vertex, so everything goes up from there. Okay. So what does this help us see? Well. Before I told you anything about this graph or explained all of this business, right, you very merrily went through and did your minus b on a and your c on a, and you got some really reasonable answers out of the sum and product of roots. There's just this one little problem. This thing has no roots, right? Like, don't you remember having to answer questions about this? Have a look at this thing. Tell us what the discriminant is. Does it have real roots? Does it have distinct roots? Does it have any roots at all? You would have normally have said, this thing doesn't have roots. And here is my evidence, right? 